Hi, everybody. Welcome to Doc NYC. Uh, I'm here with Basil Siokis. Uh, appreciate any of you who were trying to tune in earlier for this. We had uh, some technical hiccups, but uh, I want to give a big credit to our behind the scenes producer, Sarah Modo and Allison Morgan uh, for making this happen. Um, so we wanted to take this time uh, today to tell you more about uh, the Doc NYC program. I'm here with uh, Basil Siokas, who is uh, Doc NYC's Director of Programming. And um, let me see if I've got Opal Bennett uh, in the wings. Opal, if you want to uh, come on, we'll um, bring you on. Welcome, Opal. Opal is our Shorts Programmer and our Director of Filmmaker Development. Um, we announced our lineup uh, last week over a hundred documentary feature films. Uh, uh, I can't, I have, I don't have a count of the shorts. Opal, tell me how many shorts do we have? Over 80. Over 80 shorts. Look, it was really important to us this year when so many film festivals had to cancel or shrink to try to remain close to the same size that we usually are. You know, we knew so many filmmakers who had lost opportunities to show their work this year. We wanted to be the same robust home for them that we've always tried to be the past 11 years. So it's a credit to my colleagues uh, on the programming team who you're gonna meet today uh, that made this uh, happen. Um, Basil, uh, Basil and Opal, let me just take a minute to talk about online festivals. We all work for other festivals besides Doc NYC. Basil, you're at the Nantucket Film Festival. Opal, you're at the March on Washington uh, Festival. Um, you know, for people who haven't been paying as close attention to online festivals this year, tell them what they can expect. I mean, Basil, uh, why don't I start with you and your experience at the Nantucket Film Festival this year? Yeah, um, you know, Nantucket was in June uh, and we, we basically decided to cancel it at one point or actually postpone it till later in the summer, but then saw that a lot of festivals were starting to experience online uh, alternatives. And so we stuck back to our regular dates in, in June and uh, went online to a reduced program. Um, we, um, we had a really surprisingly smooth experience with it. Um, our audience is used to being in person at the festival, it's a small, you know, it's a small island. Um, they're a little bit, tend to be a little bit older. And so we were worried a little bit about that technology aspect of everything. But um, the platform we used, CineSend was really smooth. Uh, and our audience had a really, uh, generally a really smooth experience with it. Um, we had such a great experience with it that I brought Cinecent back to Doc NYC and I said, this is a platform that we should really be looking at and that's the same one that we're using. Uh, and Opal, uh, your experience at uh, March on Washington or other film festivals that you've been uh, watching from home online, uh, tell us about your experiences. Yeah, well, it's been a very different experience uh, working versus watching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> watching is better. All of you at home watching who is don't so have much to... better. Thank you, Tiff, for my industry access and uh, <laughs> Chloe Zhao's amazing Nomadland. Um, so, March in Washington, we were, were thankfully able to, uh, you know, fairly early on in the summer decide that we were going to go ahead and and um, pivot, as is the 2020 word, to a virtual version, um, but it really opened up a lot of avenues for the festival. We had record um, engagement from our audiences and, and the festival is more than just films. Um, I think one of the sort of premier events that we had in addition to the gala event that kicked off the festival was the Baldwin Buckley debate reimagined, um, which was a restaging of the 1965 um, debate between um, James Baldwin and William F. Buckley um, and it was a really, really amazing event. And there was a, you know, a post panel kind of breaking it down. We had a panel on Black Hollywood. Um, we had the um, film that features Nichelle Norris, uh, excuse me, uh, Nichelle Nichols, uh, Woman in Motion, the uh, Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek and her work with NASA to get that body to become Fantastic. More, okay, well that's uh, March on Washington well, Festival. People should go <laughs> check it out. Uh, now we want to talk about uh, the Doc NYC Festival. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen to uh, uh, take you through some of the sections at Doc NYC. Um, Basil, uh, let's start with our viewfinders uh, section, if you can see that up there. Uh, this is, we have two competition sections for featured documentaries. 
One is called Viewfinders. Tell us what that's about and what audiences should look for there. Absolutely. So Viewfinders is, uh, in th this year, it's, it's highlighting 11 films um, that demonstrate distinct directorial visions. Um, this is a fairly broad, uh, broad term, but it allows us to kind of uh, put the spotlight on, on uh, certain films that we think uh, speak, uh, that, that, that show uh, the directors really thinking about form as well as content. A um, couple of films I'd, I'd point out real quick include The Meaning of Hitler, which is a world premiere title at the festival, which is a cinematic essay uh, that offers an incredibly timely consideration of the impact and lasting legacy of Hitler. In an era of white supremacy, uh, it's an incredibly timely film that people should check out. Um, we also have films like Landfall. Um, Landfall is uh, a film about the um, about Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. It's a kind of kaleidoscopic portrait and kind of looks at various angles on uh, the impact of the hurricane uh, and people that are coming in trying to exploit the, the island. Um, those are just a couple of the films in that section, but it's a fairly diverse section uh, and it is, uh, you know, it, it really is amongst some of the strongest work, I think. You know, all the films in the festival, of course, are incredibly strong, um, but, you know, Viewfinders we really uh, try to highlight as, as much as possible what we think is, uh, you know, uh, resonating to the top. Um, so, you know, if when you go to docmyc.net on our festival, you can uh, go down to the film lineup and see all the features and shorts. And if you go to our uh, film section here, um, you can see how we've organized uh, these hundred plus feature films. We've uh, put them into different sections. So our uh, section Metropolis is our focus on New York stories. Uh, we are a New York based festival and we love to celebrate New York filmmakers and New York stories. Um, tell us, Basil, tell us a little bit more about this section. Sure, uh, this year we have 10 films, uh, 10 features that are looking at New Yorkers or New York stories. Uh, a couple that I'll point out real quick include Dope is Death, uh, which is a really fascinating film about uh, New York City in the 1970s when the Black Panthers and the Young Lords uh, decided to sort of join forces to bring an alternative treatment method for drug addiction that was plaguing the city. Um, and that was acu acupuncture, which is a surprising, surprising story there. Uh, Tupac Shakur's uh, stepfather also has a, a central role to play in that. So it's an even more interesting sort of layered backstory there. Um, you another can, film uh, You can see on our website, you know, all these pages that have the little play button um, you could, that means you can watch a trailer from uh, Dope is Death or some of these other titles that we're highlighting. And another one I'll point out is uh, Wojnarowicz, uh, which is uh, focused on the artist David Wojnarowicz, uh, who was uh, one of the stars of the art world in the 1980s and early 90s. Uh, and it really captures through audio recordings and, uh, and, and video recordings, um, really his, his passion and rage uh, around, um, around the AIDS epidemic. Um, he himself uh, was a victim of that uh, in the early 1990s, uh, but really just brings to life uh, this, this story. Um, there really hasn't been a documentary about him before, and that's kind of surprising given, given his stature in the art world. Um, so that's you know a really quintessential New York City artist and, and a very uh, specific time in New York City's history in the 1980s. Okay, so that gives you a little sampling of our uh, two competition uh, sections. Um, uh, Basil, let's just uh, explain a little bit more about some of the thematic sections uh, that you uh, created. Um, I'm going to start with Sonic Cinema, which is a section we've had for many years at the festival, focusing on music documentaries. Uh, tell us about some of the things here. Yeah, this is always a really popular section of the festival when Tom founded it. I think he had music docs uh, at midnight for the first, uh, first couple of years, um, but it's, it's been a perennial. Um, I don't think we've had a year without it. Um, in this case, um, we've got a really wide range of kinds of music um, from SoundCloud rappers to uh, the Pogues. Um, in particular, I'll point out a couple titles, including In My Own Time, uh, which is a portrait of Karen Dalton, who was a contemporary of Bob Dylan and, uh, and big in the 1960s folk music scene. Um, she had a tragic end, uh, but this film really uh, captures her story, her music in a beautiful way uh, and, and kind of, uh, some people really know, know her work, others have never heard of her and it's, it's a beautiful film that, that kind of pays tribute to her. Um, another one that I'll point out is uh, Elder's Corner, completely different part of the world that we're talking about Nigerian music. Uh, and it is a really uh, lovely portrait of uh, some of the some of the stars of Nigerian music who in, in some cases don't even have recordings of their own films. Uh, and the, the, the director who is a uh, London born Nigerian filmmaker uh, based in New York actually now, uh, he goes back and kind of re-records uh, music with them. So it's really, really beautiful, uh, lovely music. Um, and it, 
look at a different part of the world that some people may not have experience with their music. Great. So what, I'm going to pause you there, Basil. I mean, one of the things I want to stress about uh, this year's festival is that you can watch it anywhere in the United States uh, online um, for our uh, uh, dates of November 11th to 19th. This is really special for us because for the past 10 years of our festival, the you know only way you could experience the festival was by being in New York City. And uh, you know this is one of the silver linings of, uh, of our pandemic is that it has uh, you know, propelled us to go online and uh, be available anywhere in the United States. So um, the, our- And at any time. And at any time. So um, th uh, that's another- For the insomniacs in the, in the audience. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, you know, different online festivals have different ways of approaching it. Some online festivals are scheduled like regular festival, but our festival, we have so many films to sample. We didn't want to, you know, put limits on your ability to see them. So, um, uh, anytime over the nine days of the festival, you can log in and watch these films. And uh, when you press play on it, uh, you'll have 48 hours to, to complete watching it, just like if you're getting something on iTunes. Uh, we do have uh, uh, passes available if you want to dive in, get an all access pass. Right now, it's an early bird pricing for only $149 uh, until the end of next week. Um, there are also uh, some ticket packages of uh, five packs or 10 packs uh, that allow you to um, get some discounts on, on what we're doing. So um, Opal, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna bring you back uh, in a little bit when we talk about shorts, but right now I wanna bring in our other features uh, program, the features programming team of Ruth Samalo, Karen McMullen, Jesse Fairbanks, and Brandon Harrison. Uh, uh, here they are all joining me. Um, thank you all for, uh, for being here. These are the people who spent their summers uh, indoors or maybe on their back patios uh, watching um, hundreds of films uh, and the, 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 they're all veterans of our festival and we're all uh, really grateful uh, to have them. So um, I've asked uh, each of the programmers to pick two of their films um, that you know, they are, are personal favorites. They don't want uh, people to miss. So I'm gonna um, go through one by one. Ruth, uh, I'm gonna uh, start with you and um, maybe you can just, Say a word about your background as a programmer. You work for other festivals, and so people uh, kind of understand where you're coming from. Sure, thank you, Tom. Um, so I'm a, a filmmaker as well, like you were in the day, and I think that's very informative in the way that we um, we approach how much we want to support other filmmakers making their work. And I I worked for many years. Uh, for the um, um, Documenta Madrid Film Festival, which is a very um, large international festival in Spain. I work for um, the um, Impugning Impunity Human Rights Film Festival. I was the co-director. And um, I worked for many other festivals in different capacities. I also work for the Architecture and Design Film Festival here in New York. So um, yeah, my love for film, it's been like a, a thing in progress for the last 25 years and in different, different capacities. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to support as many films as we are at Doc NYC. And you know, uh, Ruth has also uh, you know, been with Doc NYC from the very first year uh, as a patron and as a, uh, it's helped us in various ways and uh, for the last several years has been a programmer. So um, Ruth, I've got up on screen here, um, the film Lost in Face, which was one of the ones that you wanted to talk about, uh, tell the audience uh, what they should look out for in Lost in Face. And you can see here the play button, it's, uh, you, you, uh, people can watch a trailer to it if they go to our website. So um, we have the North American premiere of Lost in Face, which is in an incredible film, a portrait of an amazing artist called Carlotta. And it's directed by a neuroscientist and, and also a filmmaker called Valentin Riddle. So this portrait is of an ex exceptional mind, the mind of Carlotta, who is an artist with face blindness. 
which is such an intriguing singularity that had a really profound effect in her life. Um, her portraits were shown all over Germany and that caught the attention of the director who was a scientist at the time and not a filmmaker. And he embarked on this journey to get to know her better. Um, but Carlota is a very important character to me. It's one of those documentary subjects that will grab a hold on you for the rest of your life, like, like the Edies in Grey Gardens, kind of, like that level of, you know, of interesting character because like she's been reinvent reinventing herself by doing jobs where she didn't have to interact with other people like driving a truck, you know, being a cement mixer, a projectionist, a sailor, a horse groomer. And she was also a filmmaker. Everything because she needed to protect herself and her anxiety not being able to recognize other people's faces. So this film employs outstanding animations, um, great cinematography, but Doro Gotts, and it creates really magical moments for us to understand how this singular mind, but not deficient, you know, um, embraces her life and her artwork. So I will highly recommend it for everybody that loves art and that is a little bit nerdy and wants to learn a little bit more about how a beautiful brain works. Um, All right, let's uh, go to your uh, second pick, um, Paris Calligrams, if I'm saying that right. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about this film. So um, Ulrike Ottinger, the director of Paris Calligrams, is one of the most prominent German avant-garde artists. And she's very well known for her paintings, her photographs, and, and her fictional movies. But this is a beautiful, very personal documentary that it starts with an impossible premise. How can she, as a filmmaker, made a film from the perspective of a young artist when 50 years later, she's no longer that person? So she brings us to her memories of living in Paris as a young woman in her 20s during the 60s in a spontaneous, seemingly casually associative voiceover that combines autobiography, memoir, history, you know, poetry. And I think for us, like living under these pandemic times and stuck in our houses, just um, it provides us with a beautiful time capsule in the 1960s where we can feel like luxuriously traveling back in time to the literary cafes, the jazz clubs of the Latin quarters, you know, seeing interviews with uh, amazing philosophers, artists and anthropologists um, like uh, my beloved Jan Rouge or Levi Strauss. So I think it's, a, it's an epic film and it's uh, really interesting um, to watch. So I will, I will love for people to, to join us into uh, admiring what it was this incredible time in the moment of a very important artist. So I'll just say, you know, this film is playing in our master's section uh, where, um, there, there's my tag for master's, um, where uh, we, you know, collect uh, filmmakers, you know, with a, a long body of work. Um, so some of those other uh, films in the master's section this year include the recent Oscar winners, Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar. Uh, with their film Nine to Five of Movement. Errol Morris uh, has his new film there, Sam Pollard uh, with MLK FBI, Judith Helfand and others. So, um, so Ruth, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna move to Karen uh, McMullen. Um, Karen, uh, let's, uh, let me ask you to start by talking a little bit about your background that, uh, that you bring to programming. Oh, Karen, you're on mute. It's not a Zoom call until someone talks while they're on mute. So that was me. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen McMullen. I'm a features programmer here um, at Doc NYC, which I love doing. I am also the director of programming for a small niche film festival called Tide. I screened for Sundance. I was the lead curator at New Voices in Black Cinema. And I'm recently going to work for Tribeca as a features programmer. So I got a lot of stuff to do. I started filmmaking as an editor. I worked as an editor for many years. So, um, and we all know how important editing is, especially to the, the documentary film world. So I have a special love for documentary filmmakers, um, double for the editors, and <laughs> I really have to be able to champion their work um, doing, being a programmer. Um and uh, so I asked you to pick a couple films and the one I have up on uh, screen here is uh, Through the Night. Uh, tell us about this film. Yeah, Through the Night, um, really one of my favorites of the festival. Um, Through the Night is part of our viewfinder section and it's by director Lloyd Limbaugh, um, a dynamite filmmaker. And it's about a 24 hour daycare 
center. That's right, 24 hours. There are, are essential workers who in the city and other cities that work around the clock and they have to have somewhere to put their kids. So this place is a newer shell and it's run by this husband and wife team, Nunu and Patrick, who are these really loving, selfless, tireless champions of working families. And so the film is at once a really beautiful portrait of these people and the love that they give to these children. And it also exposes the cracks in our support for working families. Um, what are people supposed to do with their children? So um, I highly recommend you check that out. Okay, uh, and then the second film that uh, you suggest is Universe. This is one I still haven't seen myself, but I'm so intrigued by uh, the description. So tell us about it. Yeah, Tom, you gotta see this film. It's a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Universe is part of our Sonic Cinema section. And it's by directors Sam Osborne and Nick Capazera. Uh, sorry, Nick, Nick Capazera. And it's in black and white. And it's a film about um, a, a trumpetist, a jazz trumpeter named Wallace Roney, who was Miles Davis's protege. And um, there was a lost jazz suite, this phenomenal work of art that was meant for Miles Davis's quartet to perform, but Davis passed away. So years later, the suite has been given to Roni to perform. And so the film is about him trying to assemble an orchestra to perform this very, very intricate piece. Um, so like, I'm not a jazz fan and I absolutely love this film. It is a great story. Um, if you love jazz, you'll love it. If you don't love jazz, you'll love it. It's a beautiful story about an artist's journey, his commitment to excellence and just trying to maintain the legacy and honor your, your mentors. Fantastic. And you, you can see on our page there, you can watch the trailer um, from that little play sign. Uh, thank you, Karen. I'm gonna bring on uh, Jesse Fairbanks uh, now. Um, Jesse, uh, you just got off uh, working at the Hot Springs uh, Documentary Festival, one of the many other festivals you work at. Uh, tell us a little bit about the background that you bring to Doc NYC. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, hi, everyone. Jesse Fairbanks. Uh, yes, as Tom mentioned, I just completed uh, the Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival as the director of programming in its 29th year. It's the oldest running documentary film festival in the country. Um, I also screen for Sundance like Karen, um, and I also program documentary features at Tribeca. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here uh, as a features programmer at Doc NYC. I've been with Doc NYC in a couple of different positions for several years now. Um, and uh, I've programmed at other places, including the Chicago International Film Festival, Nashville Film Festival. Um, there's several more, but uh, I've been programming for uh, since 2013 and uh, love what I do and love documentaries. So really excited to talk to everybody about two of the films that I'm spotlighting today. Um, the first one is Jacinta, which is a feature uh, directorial debut from director Jessica Earnshaw. Um, and it is part of our view, viewfinders section this year. Jacinta is a searing portrait of a young woman who is dealing with generations of abuse and trauma and addiction. The film includes her mother, Rosemary, and her daughter, Kaylin. So we end up looking at an entire family um, and the generational trauma that's been passed along. And for anyone that has a loved one that's struggling with addiction or that is familiar with addiction or um, is not familiar with it at all, I encourage you to watch this film. It is one of the most powerful documentaries I have ever seen that really takes you inside of what it is, the daily struggle to maintain sobriety um, and also to overcome your past. And uh, the film is beautifully shot. Jessica uh, has incredible access to the family that is uh, featured and you will not be sorry that you watched Jacinta. All right. And then the second film uh, that you talked about, Once Upon a Time in Venezuela. This is a film that had its start at the Sundance Film Festival back in January. I also showed it at the Miami Film Festival where I work in March. Uh, Jesse, uh, what stands out to you about Once Upon a Time in Venezuela? 
Yeah, so this film is directed by Annabel Rodrigo, Rodriguez Rios. Um, and we also had this at Hot Springs. Um, we also had Jacinta at Hot Springs. And, at, um, you know, it's, these films are being picked up by several festivals for a reason. Um, Once Upon a Time in Venezuela is an incredible portrait of a small village in Venezuela that is a floating village, as you can see from the image. They live on a lake that is. Um, on the opposite end of an oil refinery. So they have been facing years of uh, government neglect and uh, extensive pollution. Um, and at the, heart of the at the heart of the film are these two incredible characters, Natalie, who is a film teacher and who is a young, who's a film teacher, who is a teacher, we're in film, who is a teacher and a young woman in a community that is rapidly dying. And the other main subject is Miss Tamara, who has been a part of the, the village for decades and who is the kind of community political leader. And between the two of these characters, we explore the challenges that uh, this small village, Congo Miradora is facing. Um, and it's just incredible. The film really highlights the fragility of democracy as well as looking at some universal themes that we all grapple with when it comes to changes that we face in a modern world. And it, the film takes you deep inside of this, of this remote village. It's a unique opportunity to see what life is like on the ground for Venezuelans. Um, and it's also really beautiful to watch um, as well as thought provoking. So I encourage you to check it out. I mean, you know, I often think of one of the special things a documentary can do is to take you to a place that you would never have access to otherwise. And uh, and this film does have a real sense of place being on this, you know, floating village, uh, such a evocative term. Uh, all right, thank you, Jesse. I wanna bring up uh, Brandon Harrison, uh, our associate programmer for features, been with us um, for a few years now. Uh, Brandon, uh, let me start by asking you for uh, to share some of your background that you bring to your job. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like everyone else, I program at a number of festivals uh, and worked in film as a producer, filmmaker, and uh, currently program feature docs at Brooklyn Film Festival. I've been there for a number of years now, going on six years. I've also had some stints here, obviously back in YC for a few years, but at Tribeca and screening for POV and IFP and a number of organizations like Judge and Grant Reviewer and all that. So I love documentary film, love good stories, and I love what we have here at the festival this year. Uh, so I asked you to pick a couple titles. Uh, the first one you picked out is A Cops and Robbers Story, uh, which is having its world premiere uh, in our Metropolis section. Tell us about this film. So like, as Tom is saying, it's a world premiere story. And, it, and I feel like both of my film selections are pretty poignant now because the Cops and Robbers story, it follows, um, directed by, and spare me, Alinka, Alinka Caligarino. Um, it, it follows the, the life story of former NYPD, NYPD detective Corey Pegues. And considering the title, it's a bit of a, um, profile that explores a conundrum of an individual who has been involved on both sides of the law and what's that mean for not only law enforcement but how we perceive the way we interact in our world with the law enforcement and what does it mean to to have criminal justice enforced in our society and by whom um, it's a great story and it shows the personal struggle and influence in the way that we all live with law enforcement. So great film. Uh, it's also, I, I mean, I'll add, it's a very inventively made film because uh, uh, Linka, the director, is uh, using reenactments to uh, capture the past in a very artful way. The and if I, add, I would add about those reenactments, there is a, a, there's a nice involvement the way she incorporates that with the film. It, there's a number of levels the way she does that. So that's another uh, well done portion of the film that it really brings another aspect to the story. Yeah, there's a kind of reveal uh, near the end that's, um, that's very beautiful. All right, uh, second film, another uh, police story that you picked out, Women yeah. in Blue. Tell us about uh, this. What, what a great so, uh, evocative Martin. image this is. Yeah, this is in our American perspective section, which is a pretty poignant considering everything that's going on in our culture and our country right now. So I felt it was important to look at 
not only how the police are in, inter we interact with the police in all of our lives, but how, once again, they are individuals and people. And there is a, a gender aspect to the story. So Women in Blue by Deirdre Fischel actually had access to the Minneapolis Police Department long before the tragedy involving George Floyd. And the film follows three women officers in this department upon the rise of their first female chief. So there's a lot of incidents and struggles that have happened in Minneapolis over the years. And this inside look shows not only the way that it influences the community, but how it influences the, the officers and the lives and their struggles as they're attempting to serve the community, but how can they do that in a system that has clear flaws and issues that everyone is struggling against. So it's a very powerful film and it, it has a certain uh, pathos with it now that we've had such a, a long-standing year involving criminal justice and uh, a social upheaval in our country. Well, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary after the death of George Floyd, when we were all thinking about the Minneapolis Police Department and a uh, you know, wave of uh, news analysis to have this film that uh, really takes you in, uh, inside uh, that department that we were paying attention yeah. to. Amazing, amazing access. All right, uh, Brandon, thank you very much. Now I'm going to bring back uh, Basil. So uh, um, Karen, uh, Brandon, Jesse, uh, like we can uh, say goodbye to you, but uh, thank you for all the work you've done. And uh, thank you for uh, these picks. Um, Some. Basil, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pick out uh, two of your favorite films, personal favorites of the festival. Um, sure. <clears throat> Moments like this never last. Great title. Yeah, uh, it's a fantastic film in our Metropolis competition. Um, this is a film about Dash Snow, who was a an artist um, who passed away in uh, I believe two thousand seven or nine. Uh, it says it in the capsule, but uh, I'm blanking at the moment. Um, he was, uh, you know, he was a graffiti artist. Um, he was taking photographs uh, all over the place. Um, has a really fascinating backstory uh, about his family that he basically disowned and that disowned him uh, in a way. Uh, and and he, the, the film really captures uh, a certain energy about this young scene of artists uh, taking place in, in post 9-11 New York City. Um, I was incredibly moved by by his story and by uh, the filmmaker Cheryl Dunn's access. She's a good, she was a good friend of uh, Dash's uh, and was very much part of this scene. And so it, it, feel, it has that lived in feel. Like you, you feel like, she absolutely knew him and you feel like you knew him too by the time you finish watching this film and kind of enter in, into this world. Uh, so really poignant film, I, I love it. It's, it's really one of my favorites. Fantastic. And, then, uh, and uh, this, your second pick, uh, television uh, event. This, you know, this is one of a few films that were meant to be starting their life at the Tribeca Film Festival uh, that was meant to happen just a couple months after uh, COVID-19 shut down and so Tribeca wasn't able to uh, take place and so there are several filmmakers who have been waiting for their, their opportunity to finally have their film connect with an audience uh, and uh, this is one of those films we're really proud to be uh, showing the delayed world premiere of television event. Uh, Basil, tell us what this is. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm so thrilled that we, the Doc NYC, is able to to have this film in, in the lineup. Um, this is about the uh, the very improbable story of the 1983 uh, nuclear apocalypse, made for TV movie, The Day After. Um, I was 10 years old when this uh, when this was broadcast, and I have vivid memories of it. I shouldn't have been watching it, I'm sure, but it <laughs> left a, it left an indelible impression on me. And it really, it really kind of reveals how a film like this, which doesn't take sides in, in terms of like a, a you know, a USSR versus USA kind of nuclear altercation, but it shows the real, at what you know, the very well researched consequences of what would happen if there was an active nuclear war. Keep in mind, this is a, at a time when Ronald Reagan was president and was talking about a winnable nuclear war. Um, so the film really does go behind the scenes. That's the section it's in. It goes behind the scenes to reveal how this got made how a major broadcast uh, uh, network agreed to do so, all of the crazy controversy behind it, and the the dreams of the screenwriter and director to basically unseat Ronald Reagan through this film. Uh, so it's, it's got so many layers to it, and it's really one of, it, given the dark subject matter, it's still one of the funniest and most enjoyable uh, films I think that we have in the lineup. 
I mean, from the minute I heard about this film, I was so curious about it because uh, like you, I definitely remember the, the day after. I remember talking about it uh, the next day with uh, people at school. Um, it, uh, you know, for people who uh, aren't uh, as old as we are and don't know what we're talking about it, uh, it was really a, you know, a singular uh, television event as the title is. All right, now I'm gonna take uh, my chance to tell you about a couple uh, real standout films to me in the festival. The first one is uh, A La Calle that's playing in Viewfinders. This is also a world premiere. Um, we told you earlier about the film Once Upon a Time in Venezuela. This is another uh, film uh, set in Venezuela. Very different uh, story. Once Upon a Time in Venezuela is kind of looking at a, a small uh, you know, uh, region. A La Calle is an epic uh, made in the streets of uh, Caracas um, over many years. Uh, if you remember the film, The Square about uh, Egypt's um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, spring awakening or uh, the film Winter on Fire that was nominated for Academy Award about Ukraine. Um, this is a film kind of on that scale uh, following multiple characters, um, uh, in, you know, including some notable um, opposition politicians uh, in Venezuela. Uh, so th this is, you know, we haven't had that many opportunities to, um, uh, to get perspectives on what's been going on in Venezuela in the, the last few years. And uh, this film really does that. It's uh, this film being a world premiere, it's represented by uh, Endeavor content. I think it's you know a film that a lot of buyers will be paying attention to at uh, at Doc NYC, and we hope that uh, we'll come out of this festival with some distribution. Uh, the second film I'm going to talk about is called No Ordinary Man. Um, this film had its world premiere at the Toronto Film Festival uh, in September. Um, it is about the jazz musician uh, Billy Tipton. Um, who uh, uh, lived uh, his life uh, as a man, and it was only after uh, he uh, died um, that it was revealed that he had bo been born a woman. Um, this film is a very imaginative, um, uh, it brings a very imaginative approach to telling the story of uh, Billy Tipton. Um, as you can uh, see in this uh, still here, the, the filmmakers are uh, 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 bring in several different actors um, to, uh, to kind of perform the role of Billy Tipton. Um, uh, a lot of transgender actors who are, uh, you know, trying to put themselves in, um, in to, to imagine what it was like uh, uh, living the life of Billy Tipton at a time when there was nowhere near the kind of awareness of uh, transgender uh, identity that there is today. So um, this is a really extraordinary film, No Ordinary Man. Now I'm going to uh, turn to the shorts part of our section, uh, Opal. Uh, we've got you, uh, DeWitt Davis, uh, who's one of our two associate programs for shorts. I'm going to bring uh, you up. Um, Opal, I'm going to start with you. Um, uh, you know, first of all, can you kind of describe for us how the shorts uh, section is organized. I'm gonna uh, go into our, our program here. Absolutely, so we've got eight main programs this season. Uh, we usually have a bit more, uh, but we wanted to make sure to, I guess, leave enough attention for the other section, which is our doc NYC, NYCU shorts. It's our university showcase. And we have the most amount of schools involved this year um, that we've ever had in the five years we've been doing it since I've been here, um, all New York City area schools. And uh, we're super glad to be able to give platform to you know, really outstanding student content. So there's the Doc NYCU section for student content. And uh, then there's the regular uh, shorts programs. Oop, we've got a broken link here in our, uh, uh, in our festival. Uh, so just, un just unclick the Doc NYCU. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, see, all Very right, good. got to, <laughs> tech support here. Um, so uh, Opal, I asked you to uh, single out a couple of the programs that I'll have. Yes. Uh, and so you want to 
think about this program uh, called Roots. Uh, describe yes. to us what the theme of Roots are as, as you've conceived it. So Roots is focusing on stories that uh, investigate who we are and where we come from. Um, and it's a beautiful collection of films. So I, I do want to say to all of my shorts filmmakers, I love you all. <laughs> That's why you're at the festival. <laughs> Had to highlight for this uh, for this exercise. Uh, but this this program stood out from, to me because there are a lot of really personal stories um, featured. I'm going to go through each one. Motherland by Ellen Evans is a um, really uh, poignant look at Jamaican citizens who, these are folks who were part of the uh, Windrush generation who had had their um, UK uh, immigration status stripped. And so it, it's kind of aligned with uh, the fight that dreamers are having right now in the United States where um, England was the home that they'd always known and then they find themselves returned to Jamaica with no legal recourse to, to go back to the home that they know. So uh, oh, 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 I'm, I'm gonna pause you before you uh, describe each and every one of these films. We'll put a link in and so people can go uh, explore these films. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I, I do want to make time to uh, for, for your other section and, and for, for Wits Picks. And I'm afraid that if we talk about each and every one of them, we'll, we'll get bogged out. That is out. fair enough. Well, I will, I, will, uh, I will go to the capstone film in this section since uh, it's particularly special in my estimation, Sing Me a Lullaby, uh, which is a, a 14 year long journey. We watched the film of a um, daughter's um, uh, aiding her, ma her mother finding her long lost grandmother. Her mother had been adopted um, and been separated from her grandmother since she was a child. And uh, Tiffany goes on this amazing journey to uh, connect her mom and grandmother. It's a beautiful film. Uh, so this, I, I will, I'll add Sing Me a Lullaby, uh, also uh, uh, played at the Toronto International Film Festival, where it was a, uh, celebrated as one of the standout uh, shorts. That's right. It won a um, special jury prize. And so just to repeat, you'll find that in the uh, section called Shorts Roots, Roots which, um, yes. uh, and you've chosen that as the uh, single image. Uh, you talked about one other uh, section before I go to DeWitt. Um, and that's uh, a section that you've called All That Matters. Uh, describe how uh, this collection came together. Uh, so of course we are living through a time where we're facing lots of challenges and, um, and looking at having to defend our democracy <laughs> among other things. This is a collection of stories that are focused on uh, different fights that uh, its subjects are having around issues of politics and activism. Um, there's voter suppression, there's high school shooting, there's, um, you know, undocumented uh, fight for, for immigration rights. Uh, it's a collection of a lot of the, the issues that we hear about in the news right now through the lens of individuals um, who experience it. Some really beautiful work. Wonderful. And um, I'm going to bring on uh, Dwight Davis, one of your associate programmers, uh, and the other associate programmer who could join us today is uh, Sama Ali. Uh, that's um, right. Can you uh, just uh, you know talk about the team you have of uh, that that select the shorts? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Wit's been with me for I think three seasons now. Out of the five, I've been doing this, uh, and Sama had been a screener, and this is her second season as an associate programmer, and it's been really great to um, you know not be talking to myself about films that I might be <laughs> grappling with their selection. Um, they have beautiful taste, beautiful eyes. They, they bring uh, a different perspective that, you know, really helps inform the work. And uh, I'm so grateful for their collaboration. Uh, wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to bring on uh, DeWitt Davis um, uh, to talk about uh, uh, two sections. And uh, he had specific films that he wanted to single out uh, in these sections. Um, you know, Wit, besides having a great appetite and love for all things documentary and especially uh, shorts and the, in the work he's been doing us for uh, over the years, um, Wit also works as DocuMyC's technical director in years when we're in uh, theaters. Uh, and he holds that role at the Miami Film Festival where I also work. And I brought him in that role at the Montclair Film Festival, another festival uh, that uh, I used to be the artistic director of. 
Um, so he's uh, someone who's been with us for uh, a long time uh, before being a colleague. Uh, he, he was a frequent goer to the program we do at the IFC Center. It used to be called Stranger Than Fiction. Now it's called Pure Nonfiction. Um, Wit, it's uh, been such a pleasure to uh, have you with us for almost 15 years now um, through all the things we've done. Um, so tell us about uh, th this program, Shorts All Loan Together. And, and I think you had a specific title in here that you wanted to single out. Yeah, well, um, um, all along, all alone together is about um, sort of individuals and in finding themselves in their circumstances and their need for connections with each other. And uh, there's some really great films in there. Um, I think Perfectly Frank was really good uh, um, about a man uh, that comes out in his uh, early, in his late 50s. Um, another one is uh, The uh, the Seeker, um, which is a portrait of uh, an excommunicated uh, or uh, Amish woodworker. Um, I thought that one was really excellent, uh, but I think my favorite out of the section was uh, Huntsville Station. And um, that follows the day at the bus station just outside of the Huntsville prison and the beginning of the day where the prisons are prisoners are released um, and uh, sort of talks to them and their feelings and their thoughts um, about being released, them trying to reach out to their family members. And um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just as they're getting out of long terms in prison and moving out back out into the world and trying to reconnect with people outside of prison. And I thought it was, um, I thought it was some great observational document, um, a great observational document and, um, you know, kind of a hands-off uh, feel on it. And I thought it was really, really lovely. That's wonderful. And, you know, look, lots of times at the short section um, gets overlooked at, uh, at film festivals as, uh, as people pay attention to the, the, the features. Um, this year, while we're all uh, watching at home, I think it's a great opportunity to really explore uh, the shorts. Um, and, you know, sometimes a story like this told in 14 minutes um, can be just as powerful as a story uh, told in 90 minutes. Um, so wait, I'm gonna ask you about this other section uh, called New York Strong, a collection of uh, New York stories uh, in our shorts program. Um, what can you tell us about uh, these films? And I think you had a favorite in here to highlight. Yeah, I mean, uh, New York stories is, is um, uh, stories from across New York. Um, uh, some of them with a gritty feel and then uh, sort of about the rebirth and you know the the movement of New York of New York and New Yorkers uh, across the city and the state um, I mean uh, I thought urban growth is is one that was that was quite excellent um, uh, showing the the houses in the Navy Yard and um, the change of the city from uh, where these all these houses I believe got knocked down to build Wegmans um and a shopping mall um uh, but they've just been hidden out there uh in the brooklyn navy yards for a long time um i also thought that uh, a week in june about the protests that were happening uh, right at the beginning of the uh right at the beginning of the black lives matter and um for uh in in june for this year um was uh, quite excellent and uh, great to great observational like, sort of passing um, uh, all the different moments in that. And um, I think my favorite though was uh, Road to Roxham, which is a story about, um, it's a uh, underground taxi uh, service or uh, not, or taxi industry that's popped up um, to pick people up in Plattsburgh, New York, and then drive them to this um, uh, un this uh, non-border crossing into Canada. So if they cross over the border there, they're immediately arrested. There's not a border enforcement, there's just a police station. And it's the stories of the people that have joined that industry and also the people that they're taking there. So these are people who came to the US as asylum seekers and now um, because of the current uh, administration and its policies are now uh, sneaking out of the U.S. again into Canada 
to uh, make sure that they're safe and staying in the in North America and the West and, and away from the troubles they had in their in their own countries. Um, so many great stories to explore in the shorts program. Uh, Opal and DeWitt, thank you very much for all the work uh, you put in along with Sama Ali. Uh, we can let you go now and uh, Basil and I will uh, wrap up this conversation. So thanks very much, uh, Opal and DeWitt. Thank um, you. So I uh, told you earlier about um, our tickets and passes, different ways uh, to access the festival. Uh, I know that a online festival is, you know, new to uh, many of us. Uh, so if you have questions, we have an FAQ under our about section um, that will, you know, answer how you get tickets, how you use a ticket pack if you want to see more than one film, how you uh, stream. Um, you know, this year you can watch films on your computer. You can. If you have an Apple TV or Roku or other devices, you can download a DocNYC app to, uh, to watch there. Um, uh, and then uh, next week, um, uh, we invite you back to Facebook Live. Every day of the week, we're gonna be having more conversations like this, visiting 10 different cities. Uh, we're gonna uh, start on Monday in Boston and Washington, DC. Tuesdays, Philadelphia, Miami. Wednesday, my hometown, Detroit and Chicago. Thursday, going to Ohio, from Cleveland and Dayton, and then to Columbia, Missouri, home of the True Falls Festival, and winding up on Friday in San Francisco, the Bay Area, and Los Angeles. Uh, at each of those stops, we'll be talking to filmmakers who have connections to those cities or whose uh, films have connections to those cities. We'll also be talking to local film organizations like the Scribe Video Center in Philadelphia and the Black Star Film Festival in Philadelphia or the Detroit Narrative Agency uh, in Detroit uh, and so on. Um, so uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to learn more about our festival uh, every day uh, next week, uh, Monday through Friday. Um, I'm gonna double check our uh, see if any questions uh, have come in. I don't, uh, I'm not seeing any. Um, so uh, I don't have any of those to answer. Basil, have I forgotten anything that I should? Uh, that, that uh, seems about it. Um, you know, we, 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 I will say that, you know, there are 100, there are 100 plus features and obviously about 80, 80 or 90 shorts. So we can only cover just a small sampling, but we encourage everybody to check out the website, check out the, the trailers that Tom pointed out earlier. Uh, there's something for everyone in DocNYC, and that's one of the main reasons we kept it as large as it is to highlight as much work as possible. Yes, I'm sorry to the filmmakers who we didn't have a chance to mention, but we're going to have lots of more opportunities to be uh, talking to film goers in the next three weeks in the lead up uh, to the festival, including uh, road trip uh, next week. Um, if you want more conversations uh, with filmmakers, I invite you to check out my podcast pure nonfiction. You can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your uh, podcasts. Um, those are conversations that uh, I really enjoy doing. I want to give a huge thanks to the whole Doc NYC team, um, our, certainly our uh, programmers who uh, you met today. Also, all the hardworking people behind the scenes, the executive director, Raphael Nehausen, who's also my wife, um, I want to give a big thanks to our industry uh, director, uh, Caitlin Boyle, to our producers, Allison Morgan and Sarah Modo, and uh, everyone else that makes Doc NYC run. Uh, Dana Krieger, our uh, program manager, can't leave her out. Asha Phelps, who uh, oversees ticketing, our uh, team members, the IFC Center, John Banco and uh, Harris Dew, and I apologize to anyone who uh, I'm leaving out. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, please go to the docnyc.net website uh, for more. And now we're out. Great. Thanks, everyone.